Hey everyone, so today we're going to get into the very first module of the course in which we'll start thinking a little bit about the core determinants of the vote. So the entire semester we're going to be thinking about this very basic foundational question, which is why do people vote the way that they do? And if we were here in a, an in-person classroom, we would already be thinking about this in groups. We'd already be talking about this together, thinking about some of our, you know, uh, prevailing assumptions about this very question. Um, but because we're not in a group um, setting yet, and we're going to get into that when we meet um, on Wednesday, I want to uh, first introduce a few different perspectives that political scientists have had over uh, the years. And I think in doing so, this is going to lead us to develop a framework for the rest of the course. We're going to be able to understand um, why exactly it is that, that we think about voting from this particular structure. So um, I've got Milhouse here on the board um, to, uh, uh, to introduce us to some of the early political scientists' perspectives about voting. Um, certainly they didn't have the benefit of, you know, your cable TV pundits with uh, moving screens and things uh, to tell them about uh, different electoral votes in different states. Um, instead, what they had at the end of the day was math. Um, and so some of the earliest approaches to understanding voting in a systematic way, in a, so a social scientific way, uh, can, be, can be traced to this essentially rational choice perspective. So that's maybe the first perspective that we can think about from the, from the, uh, the, the course material is the rational choice perspective. Um, just moving back to that for, for a moment, um, the rational choice perspective is really making the assumption that we can um, predict people's behavior on the basis of simple cost-benefit calculations. We can make an assumption about uh, what people value, you know, uh, what get, brings them the most utility, essentially, and then how those utility-maximizing calculations will lead them to choose one candidate over the other, or even choose to vote or not vote. And so we'll see many examples of this rational choice perspective in the weeks to come. Um, there's another uh, approach that we can think about that certainly the reading for this week is um, is introducing you to, which um, is the uh, sort of social perspective, the early kind of sociological perspective. And you can see I've got this you know terrible comic here where this little tiny child says I want to be an astronaut, and of course this um, sociologist says ah, ah ah you know you have you have a zero point zero 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 one percent chance based on the demographic you know characteristics of of you and your social group, and so. Um, you know, of course, they're the worst bullies because they make inferences about outcomes on the basis of sort of social uh, social reality. And so people like uh, Berylson and Lazarus Feld McPhee and, and some of the early uh, Michigan school uh, researchers, Phil Converse being, uh, you know, a, a notable uh, individual beginning in the sociological school, but maybe um, moving more towards a psychological perspective at some point, um, they are really interested in how groups um, coalesce, how they form uh, opinions, how they sort of go to the polls um, with, with certain group attachments in mind. And so uh, early sociology, in contrast to this rational choice perspective, said, hey, you know, you can explain voting on the basis of people's, you know, utility and their, their cost-benefit calculations all you want. Um, but if you ignore the fact that they belong to groups and exist in so social reality, then um, you're going to miss out on a lot of um, essentially predictive power. You're not going to know uh, how people are going to behave unless you understand what groups they belong to, what groups they feel like they belong to, um, and how those groups historically tie into the, the political parties and the voting process. So that's the second approach, the sociological approach. Uh, third, right, we go back to that University of Michigan uh, school where sort of the early sociologists were hanging out. Um, we started to see with people like Phil Converse um, and eventually uh, scholars like John Zauer and others, a more psychological theory of uh, voting behavior. And so I've got this comic here that you can see. It says, uh, if you can't see this grainy image, it says on the, on the road sign here, absolutely no machete juggling. And the, the man's uh, talking to this woman and says, suddenly I have an urge to juggle machetes, um, indicating, of course, right, that this is the essence of human nature, that um, if you tell us no, then all of a sudden we want to do something. Um, this is a psychological kind of principle, uh, a really flippant example of one, but uh, we need to better understand, uh, would argue these scholars, sort of how the brain works in order to understand why people are making such weird, voting, seemingly weird voting decisions when they go to the ballot box. And so I think all three of these um, 
insights together are really important and valuable, and we're not going to leave any of those three perspectives off the table when we talk about um, our forecasts in this in this uh, 2020 election. I think every single one of those uh, different schools are going to provide valuable and you know critical insights um, into understanding what's happening. Um, I would also add to that list if if, um, if we wanted to an institutionalist perspective, uh, where we're thinking about how. Um, the structures that exist, right, the formal and informal rules that govern uh, elections actually also play a big role in determining uh, why individuals vote the way they do. Um, but again, w with these kind of three plus one, right, with the institutionalist perspective added on, with all of these different things uh, combined, I think we can start to arrive at a constellation, let's call it, of potential factors that might have an influence on voting. And so if we think about the, the core determinants of the vote, I think the next thing that I want to introduce to you is something that is perhaps the most foundational graphic in all of voting behavior research. It's something that you're going to see referred to a lot in the literature, um, certainly in uh, the reading for this week. Um, a lot of that is drawing on this foundational insight. Um, the Lewis Beck et al. reading, for example, um, the, the, the uh, American Voter Revisited, is uh, something that, that sort of is the spiritual successor to this original graphic. Um, this is what's called the funnel of causality. And I want to use this graphic as a springboard to help us make forecasts in the election and to understand this idea that voting is not s something that we can simply uh, explain away with a single explanation, right? It's something that defies monocausality and is very complicated in terms of all of the different things that combine to influence the ultimate vote decision. So let's take a look at that graphic now. This definitely looks like a pretty complicated image, I would say, but don't fear, don't worry. We're going to be talking about sort of all of these different pieces, all these different crazy arrows uh, throughout the, the entire course of the semester. And so really, uh, this funnel of causality, as it was envisioned by what we might call the Michigan School um, of, uh, of Voting Behavior, um, started to put together, for the very first time, um, a sort of, sort of comprehensive model for all of the different factors that might combine to have an influence on whether or not people vote, say, for the incumbent, or whether people vote for one candidate uh, over the other. And so really the thing I, I like to think about with this funnel of causality is this idea that, that, the, that all of these different drivers are all sort of squeezing somebody you know, through this funnel um, to eventually arrive at this one single uh, political action, which is the vote. And at the very back, these are what we might call the heavy variables that are doing the most pushing, that have the most influence um, on the ultimate decision. But they're also, in addition to being very heavy, Things that are also extraordinarily um, far, both uh, sort of um, uh, historically, right, chronologically, and also conceptually from the ultimate vote choice. Things like the economic structure of a country, right? Whether you, you know whether the country is a highly unequal country, whether it's a highly equal country, um, where somebody might fall in that economic structure, that sort of economic ladder, right? Someone's um, the social divisions inherent in that country, right? If we think about um, you know, for example, like um, the culture wars in the United States of, you know, religious um, fundamentalists versus like skeptics or whatever, you know, social divisions that are based on race and class, um, these baseline kind of uh, uh, fractures that, that uh, are, draw the battle lines between different groups in our politics. Uh, and then also historical patterns, you know, where the parties have lined up in terms of their um, their closeness or their willingness to woo those different groups over time, um, how the parties have changed their, their uh, platforms over time, right? all these things combine um, to paint a really complicated pattern um, that results in the kind of voting coalitions that we see today. Um, but as we get closer to people's ultimate psychological vote, we also see some other uh, sort of heavy variables here that are the result of these long-term, you know, sort of giant historical, um, you know, historical political processes. Um, one of them being group loyalty. You see, th th this actually shows up in two places here in the funnel because it's so important, right? The kinds of groups that where we attach our loyalty, where we say, I feel like a member of this group, I feel like a, a, you know, that I belong to this group, um, I would call myself one of these people, right? Whatever that, that um, label might be, right? We, we attach labels to our identities. This is ultimately our, our, our uh, uh, politically relevant identities. Um, of course, combined with that, we might have value orientations, which are at the most basic level, 
the kind of core fundamental opinions that we have about the world around us and about politics. Um, not simply like, you know, something, you know, very obscure or specific about policies, but like extremely broad-based um, ideas about the way that the world should work, about um, the way that, that uh, politics should function in our society. And so all of these things together combine, and we see that now as we get closer to the end of the funnel, we've got this, this key driver here that the, the Michigan School, that the uh, political psychology sort of uh, group of scholars continues to, to think is, you know, perhaps the most important driver of the vote, and that is party identification or party attachment. Um, whether or not you call yourself a Republican, a Democrat, or neither, uh, is an incredibly important piece of the voting uh, puzzle, and one that um, obviously has a very direct and clear link to this vote outcome. But of course, that seems like a very basic idea, but really, because of the fact that that attachment is itself determined by so much of this like chronologically extensive historical sociological kind of, you know, uh, soup, right, that's all squeezing down to affect your party attachment, it's actually a very complicated question, right? To back up this funnel to try to figure out why somebody votes the way they do, um, this whole story is actually a very, a very complex story. And the story's not over because we've got other stuff here, right? We've got, you know, uh, people's, the influence of people, right, who are coming into our social uh, networks, We've got the influence of the media, right? We talk a lot about, oh, you know, people vote the way they do just because the media tells them to, right? We've got um, government actions. We've got things that, that uh, the incumbents did or didn't do in office, right? Think about some of the key actions of former, um, you know, uh, incumbents like the um, New Deal or the Vietnam War, you know, or, um, you know, or the Iraq War or, or any number of different actions that, that government took or didn't take. Uh, to influence people's perceptions of those incumbents. Um, we've got the campaigns themselves, right? When you know, you've got some campaign manager who's running attack ads or who's not running attack ads, all of those things might um, have an, uh, an influence on people's perceptions of the candidates and of uh, voting. And then finally, at the end of the day, we've got some basic conditions, issue opinions, and people's just, you know, perceptions of how the candidate, you know, seems. Right? Is this somebody who you might enjoy spending time with? Is this, you know, the classic one is, is this someone that you, you'd be able to have a beer with or whatever, which of course is a very silly kind of political um, you know, talking point. But this is to say that we can't ignore the fact that some of these different things, like economic and political conditions, right? I mean, one of the big questions that we might contend with right now is how might the severity of the COVID-19 crisis have an influence on people's vote choice? That's far after people's value orientations were developed, far after they developed party attachments, this is a very recent thing, right? Chronologically close to the vote. Um, How is the economy doing, right? What campaign ads were run on, on what day? All of these short-term influences are also swaying people, um, you know, to vote for the incumbent, to vote against the incumbent, to vote for Democrats, to vote for Republicans, uh, to vote for independent candidates. All of these things matter. And so, as we try to develop forecasts and try to predict at a statewide level how the vote is going to fall out, I think that this kind of uh, a map, a mental map, is gonna be incredibly important to you. Because I think each one of us, what I'd like us to do is to read this literature that we're being exposed to really carefully. And I want us to think about these different pieces. And there may be other pieces as well that are not represented on this very parsimonious image. I want you to think about this and ask yourself, if I could like put some of these things in bold, right? For, for me, for my model, I think that this thing is gonna be more important than other people are giving it credit, right? I think that people's, you know, people's um, you know, exposure to media, that's really what's gonna cause people to vote the way they do. I think that people's uh, willingness to attach themselves to specific you know, um, ethnic or racial groups, right? To call themselves, um, to say that they belong to one or, th or the other group that is gonna be really determinative in this election. Um, I think that people, you know, um, people's party attachments actually won't matter in this election. Um, I don't know what your theory is, right? But it's up to you to develop it. I want you to think about, if you were to essentially assign um, importance, relative importance to these various influences that are ultimately gonna result in people's vote choice at the end of the 2020 election, where would you assign the most importance? And that, I think, that framing question is where we want to begin this semester because it's going to result in a lot of valuable conversations about what really is going on in 2020 
And whether or not this model, by the way, this image is from 1964, um, whether or not this model holds up in 2020, or whether this funnel is some other strange shape that we don't yet really understand. So that's my challenge to you today, is to really start thinking about this, how you'd weight these different things in your mind. Um, and uh, as you read, really think about how you might revise those assumptions uh, on the basis of the political science literature. So that's all for now. I really look forward to our first meeting on uh, Wednesday at 4.30. Uh, until then, have a wonderful week and stay safe.